encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is the Light Network. where every day is a great day with Jesus. This is Today with Jesus, and I'm Robert Hatfield. And I'm Dan Winkler. Thank you for making this podcast a part of your busy day. Today with Jesus is what this is all about, spending this time right now Mm -hmm. thinking about Jesus Christ, our Lord. Tell me again, Robert, we're beginning a brand new season. Remind me what we're doing. We're looking at the book of Hebrews, but in this season, and as we did last season, we're not really studying verse by verse. We're considering descriptors of Jesus in the book of Hebrews. Some of those are implied and some of those are specified. Today's episode, we have a specified descriptor of Jesus. So you have these different, reading through these 13 chapters, the Holy Spirit through an unknown author will say this about Jesus. He will describe Jesus all through the book, for example, as our high priest. We have a great high priest. Well, that is a specified descriptor of Jesus. And so when we come to those, we we take pause and we say, let's think more about that, Robert. Mm -hmm. Jesus as our high priest. And of course, we come now to uh, see Hebrews 7, Mm -hmm. verses 11 through 28. Mm -hmm. And let's let everybody know kind of what we want to think about today. Yeah. Well, first, let's just, for our listening audience and our viewing audience, let's tell people that we're in a different studio today. Uh, We are at the Connect Conference in Nashville, Tennessee, and we did one of these last year at this time. And if if you're interested in learning more about how to share Jesus with others, the Connect Conference is a great place to come. Yes, it is. It's always in July uh, in Nashville, the Creve Hall Church building, and uh, it's a great place to be. And we're thankful to have some, a few uh, additional people who are with us today as well, live and in the flesh. We come to Hebrews chapter 7, and today our descriptor of Jesus is found in verse 22. And for the sake of just titling the episode, we'll pick up right in the middle of this context. It says, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. So our title today, Jesus, guarantee that things are better. Okay. Mm. So help me with this concept of guarantor, first of all. I want you to help me with that word. That's not a word that I use a lot. (laughs) Would you know that this is the only time that this Greek term is used in our New Testaments? Uh, It's translated the guarantee in some translations, New American Standard, Christian Standard. It's translated a surety. Uh, A space surety, two words uh, in the New King James and King James versions, and it's translated the surety in the American Standard Version. So I think that uh, to me, hearing synonyms helps me get my mind around a word. Uh, The varying translations sort of help us understand that we're talking about something that is sure to be the case. Outside the New Testament, this term carried the meaning of a pledge or of a security, especially in legal proceedings like for bail, Mm -hmm. uh, B-A-I-L, for bail. And Jesus himself then, is the context, has provided a guarantee that God provides a better covenant with a better hope. And so we're finally now in our study of Hebrews to one of the key concepts and terms in the book of Hebrews, and that is this idea of better. And of course, that's about to be extrapolated and expounded upon in the coming chapters. So let's think on this idea of a guarantor. Let's say that you're going to rent an apartment. Okay. But you've never rented an apartment before. Let's say that you're uh, in college. Uh, way, way, way. I'm going to have to go back a yes, bit. Sure. You Thank you. That far back. Right. You're in college and you're leaving the dorm life mm-hmm. and you want to rent an apartment, but you don't have any credit at all. Or money, but that's another <laughs> story. <Okay. laughs> and so you get someone to co-sign the lease with you. Mm-hmm. And that someone does have good credit. Mm-hmm. and that's Thanks for someone, doing that, by the way. Yeah, I appreciate your help. You're, you're welcome. Mm-hmm. Okay, sure. <laughs> and that's someone does have good credit, and so they co-sign the lease, and they are guaranteeing 
that the lease will be paid mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So they become the guarantor, mm -hmm. the, you're, the, the, the person that is renting you the apartment knows for certain that this apartment will be paid for monthly because of the cosigner or the guarantor. Mm -hmm. And that's the concept here, isn't it? Yeah. Where Jesus is called the, the surety or the guarantor. And I so, even read, by the way, that in the Greco-Roman world, it referred to someone who had assumed an obligation in place of another. There you go. Which is what the cosigner would okay. do. Okay. Yeah. So he's the guarantor. You can be certain of what in this passage? Well, of a better covenant. So says. there's something far, far better for us to enjoy than anybody had enjoyed prior to Jesus. And you can be certain that what we have is so much better than any religion of days gone by because Jesus will guarantee it. Mm -hmm. He's the guarantor of the fact that Christianity is a better covenant, or we might say a better arrangement. Mm. Now, put that into the overall context of Hebrews and tell me what that <laughs> meant to the initial reader. Right. Well, Hebrews chapter 7 gets a little complex. And <laughs> actually, if, if our audience here or those of you who are listening or watching later, you know we've spent several episodes in chapter 7. Uh, it, you know, in my mind, it sort of breaks down three ways as we go through Hebrews chapter 7. First, there's the necessity of something better. Now, our term down here in verse 22 that Jesus is guarantor actually says this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Well, we need to know why, why was something else needed? Why was something better needed? Now, implicit within the question is a response, right? Obviously, what was before it was somehow not as good as what we have now. And that can be a little bit of a complicated thought for students of the Bible. What do you mean, you know, that the, the old covenant wasn't as good as the new covenant? But the writer of Hebrews helps us out a little bit with that here in chapter 7. First of all, we have this argument, and it's a complex one, about the Levitical priesthood over against a new priesthood that would come into play under the new covenant. And we would have a priest who would arise after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the priest king who encountered Abraham all the way back in the book of Genesis. And Abraham blessed him, indicating, as our writer will tell us in the early uh, verses of chapter 7, therefore that the inferior is blessed or uh, that the inferior is going to be the one who is going to offer a blessing to the superior, and then Melchizedek turned around and blessed him. All right, and so we have the first time that the Greek term translated better is used in our chapter. It's translated in the ESV superior mm -hmm. here in verse 7. It is beyond dispute, inasmuch as Melchizedek blessed Abraham, that the inferior is blessed by the superior. All right, so this order of the priesthood that is to come is going to be a better priesthood than that which would come from the descendants of Abraham. And you remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 sons, among whom are Levi, or is Levi, and from Levi comes this Levitical priesthood. The writer of Hebrews tells us that even Levi, still, as he says, within the loins of Abraham, finds himself subservient, subservient to Melchizedek because the inferior is blessed by the superior. Psalm 110 verse 4 said, The time would come, and the Lord swore it by an oath, when one would arise as priest after the order of Melchizedek. What we're saying is already baked into this chapter of Hebrews chapter 7 is this idea of an inferior priesthood. The priesthood oversaw the dealings on behalf of the people in the covenant itself. And therefore, an inferior covenant that needs to give way to something else. Let's check this out. In Hebrews chapter 7, uh, beginning at verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, 
For under it the people received the law. What further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? It was Jesus, by the way. That's Jesus. Yeah, we should say that. Good, thank you. Rather than the one named after the order of Aaron. All right, so here's the main point that the writer is making. The, the, the issue with the old law is that people cannot be reconciled to God, forgiven, justified, sanctified, as a result of, as he's going to say a little later, and we'll look at this, human weakness, that is our imperfection. Perfection had been, if, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there have been? Drop down to verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Here's the necessity of something better. It, it, it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The writer will remind us of a little bit later in the flow of the book of Hebrews. But for now, here's the issue. The old law does not save because the sacrifices of the old law are not able to take away sin. Now, I need to sidebar and then I'm going to be quiet because I want to hear you talk more than I want to hear me talk. Remember, the old law does serve a purpose. And that purpose ultimately find its, finds its fulfillment in Jesus himself. That's Galatians chapter 3. It was a tutor, a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So if that's the point of the law all along, the writer of Hebrews is merely describing for us in perhaps a little different detail why something better was even necessary. There's so, the necessity of something better. Help me with this word in verse 11, perfection. Mm -hmm. And then we come down here in verse 19, perfect. Diane yeah. and I have this tit for tat at, at home. I tell her, you're absolutely perfect. You are just perfect. She says, well, you're 99.99. So <laughs> okay. I'm always a, I'm always a work in progress. Sure. Yeah. She's arrived. She's perfect. <laughs> what does this mean by perfection or perfect? Yeah. Does that mean that the Old Testament could not make me absolutely spotless everything that I want to be in my spiritual prowess? <laughs> what does it mean? Well, the idea has to do essentially with maturity, completion, uh, and it, it really, it's, it's the same term that's used by Jesus back in Matthew 5. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So what we understand as humans, that can't mean a sinlessness. It can't mean a perfection. Uh, it has to do with this maturity, and in the context, it refers to what is required for us to draw near to God. Thus, verse 19, drawing near to him. I like to think of a synonym for perfection in yeah. the word that's translated here as complete. Completion. Yeah. Or completion. Mm -hmm. And that being the case, Hebrews 7.11 says, the Levitical priesthood, the old law with the Levitical priesthood, mm -hmm. could not make people spiritually what God wanted them to be, yeah. spiritually complete. Right. And you come down here to verse 19, the law made nothing spiritually complete. And if we could turn the page once mm. over to chapter 10, a passage that you referenced, but look at its surrounding verses, T uh, chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. Since the law has but a shadow, has but a shadow of good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make complete, mm -hmm. perfect, those who draw near. The law and the sacrifices of the old law and the Levitical priesthood of the old law could make nothing spiritually complete, verse 2. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshiper, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. The Old Testament sacrifices could not cleanse you from your past sins. Mm -hmm. I love verse 2 of Hebrews 10 because it tells me what forgiveness really is. When I'm cleansed of my past sins, there's no more consciousness of sin. Mm. You say, is that in God's mind or in our mind? Yes. 
God forgets when he forgives, accommodatively speaking, according to Hebrews 8, uh, about verse 12. But we can do that too. We don't have to feel feelings of guilt, and we don't have to be shamed by anybody else when we have been forgiven by God of our past. There's no more consciousness of sins. The Old Testament sacrifices, the Old Testament priesthood, the Old Testament law could not do that for anybody. Mm. We can enjoy that. We have an arrangement with God that is so superior to that, so much better than that. And we know that to be true because somebody is the surety the guarantor of that. And who is that somebody? Hey, that's Jesus. Jesus. Do you know that he is named for the very first time in this chapter? Think about how complex chapter seven is. It's it's points to him constantly through this Melchizedek Uh speech. But in verse 22, this makes Jesus. That's the first time in the chapter. And really since back in chapter six, verse 20, that he has been specifically named in this way. And uh, what, I've, what I've been told, and you would know about this better than I, but that the arrangement of the verse in the original language places the name Jesus at the end, which sort of puts that exclamation point uh-huh. there. I like how we both wrote on our imaginary tablets <laughs> when, that, when that happened. Uh, so to that point, drop back to verse 18 of chapter 7 and look at what the writer is saying here. On the one hand, a former commandment is set aside mm-hmm. because of its weakness and uselessness. That is relative to what we've just said. All right. Uh, it, obviously, the old law served a purpose, but within the flow of the argument that the writer is making, it it stops short of what the need actually is. Uh, What he's doing is highlighting why we need Jesus. Uh, And then the law made nothing perfect, verse 19, but on the other hand, okay, something's been set aside, verse 18, but now something else is introduced. Something better is introduced, better hope through which we draw near to God. So there's the necessity of something better and it finds a reality in this man named Jesus who is the surety, the guarantee of this better covenant. So why would it be called better? What's better about it? (laughs) The fact that there was no forgiveness under the old system. Today, there is forgiveness. You don't have to worry about your past. Isn't that a good news? That's good news, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And she's looking over at you and smiling. You don't either. (laughs) And I don't either. If we have been forgiven by God, our past sins are gone. They are a thing of the past. And God does not filter our identity through our past having been forgiven mistakes. That's why the gospel is good news. The better part of this is back then they had to offer sacrifices every year, just kind of keep up with the sins that they had been committing so that they could be rolled back, rolled forward a year, a year, a year. But finally Jesus comes, he is sacrificed. He makes it possible for me to be forgiven once and for all of my past And we continue to sin. I have. I do. You do. I'm sure I know you do well. (laughs) Thank you. We both do. You're right. And the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. Mm -hmm. So the blood of Jesus is responsible for all of our past being taken away. And the blood of Jesus, as long as we walk in the light, is responsible for us staying in this forgiven state. I love to call it a perpetual state of forgiveness. I'm always in a state of having been forgiven by God, Mm -hmm. as long as I'm walking in the light. That's why this is such a better arrangement. It's an arrangement where I am okay with God. 
I've been forgiven by God by the blood of Jesus. I stay forgiven by God by the blood of Jesus. I'm okay with God. I stay okay with God. Under the old law, that was not possible. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is called a better arrangement with God. And Jesus is the reason and the certainty, the surety, the guarantor yeah. of that. That's what I love about this chapter because, it, all right, this sounds great. You know, and bearing in mind the writer to the Hebrews is writing to these people who evidently are being tempted to go back into Judaism. Mm -hmm. And so an argument like this is very important. But to, to merely point out that that old law was incapable of re the removal of sins once and for all forever. Uh, well, th that, that sounds good, but tell me how that's so. It's kind of like, okay, I I'm glad that you say you're willing to, to give me this much money toward a loan. But, uh, you know, how can we be sure that all of this is going to work out the way that we need it to? Jesus, here's the reason. Here's the way that all of this is made possible. And so what he's doing is he's saying, yes, we have this great offer from God, but look at how it's manifested. Look at how it works out. Look at the way, the reason why this is possible. And that's because of him. Something else. We have the first usage in the book of Hebrews of the word covenant here in verse 22. He's the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, this thought is going to be further developed in the discussion beginning in the next chapter mm -hmm. and throughout the remainder, really, of the book of Hebrews. Um, and Hebrews develops the theme of a new covenant more fully than, I guess, any other New Testament book or any other New Testament writer. But this idea of uh, we're entering into this agreement and God says, okay, here's what I want. These are the terms and this is what I'm going to do. And I'm inviting you into this. And here's what I'm, here's what you got to do in order to keep this covenant. And to your point about this perpetually available forgiveness that is available under this new covenant. Well, 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 yeah. I didn't make myself clear. It's not perpetually available. Is perpetually it's given. Per perpetually enjoyed. Enjoyed. Okay, yes. there you go. Because as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus right. keeps on cleansing That's us from sins. That's not what saved, always saved. Right. That's, you have to walk in the light, yeah. contextually maintain the proper attitude towards sin. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then you stay in this perpetual state. You enjoy this perpetual state of forgiveness. Yeah. That's why Christianity is a far better arrangement with go. God. Yeah. A little later, uh, this is uh, when we're taking the Lord's Supper, I love to go. Is it Hebrews chapter 10 where it says, okay, those priests, they go and those, they offer those sacrifices year by year yeah. continually, which can never take away sins. Chapter 9. Okay, chapter yeah. 9. Uh -huh. And he comes and offers one sacrifice for sins one forever. Yeah. That's amazing. But look at what's happening here. Okay, so at the heart of a very complex argument that is Hebrews chapter 7 is God who desires a relationship with you and who has guaranteed the covenant that undergirds and makes possible that entire relationship through the gift of his son, Jesus. Wow. If I were to underline phrases or verses in Hebrews 7, I would want to first of all go to chapter 4, which says, see how great this man was. Now in context, it's talking about Melchizedek. And the first three verses talk about differing things about Melchizedek, but the inspired author's point is this. What you can say about Melchizedek is what you can say in analogy about Jesus. So this is about Melchizedek. That, 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 you could say that about Jesus. Same thing here. Same thing here. See how great Melchizedek was. But his point implied is, can't you see how special Jesus really is as a priest after the order of Melchizedek? Look how great Melchizedek was. But Jesus is a high priest like him. Look how great Jesus was that Jesus is. Not only was he special, chapter 7, verse 4, but rather he is the surety. See how those both start with an S? That was good. Surety, the guarantor of a better arrangement with God. Robert, I'd like to drop down a little bit further into chapter 8 okay. and flesh this out a little more. Good. In chapter 8, 
verse 6. As it is, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry. Don't miss that word. Ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better. Hmm. Jesus said, it tells us that Jesus has made an arrangement. He's the mediator of an arrangement with God. Here I am. Here's God. And Jesus is in between and he mediates. He's the go between me and God. And he keeps me right with God. And that's what makes this arrangement a better arrangement. But it says, he obtained a ministry. I want to focus on those two words rather quickly. The word obtained translates a perfect tense verb. Something happened back there, and the consequences of that remain to this day. So Jesus died on the cross. He sacrificed himself. His blood was shed, mm -hmm. and right there, a ministry of redemption was given birth. Mm. And the consequences of that sacrifice remain to this day. He obtained a ministry. There are different words in the New Testament translated minister or ministry. Uh, one of them, for example, is diakonia, deacon, table server. Um, this one right here is a word that means a public official. Mm. Uh, a fireman, a policeman, for example, a soldier keeping us safe, a public official. Jesus, back there with his death, obtained a position where he could serve us as a public official and, and provide something more excellent and better than any religion man has ever known. I am right with God right now, as are you. We stay right with God right now and in the future, as are you, because of Jesus Christ. I want to pause for a moment, and I'm going to preach for a while. Okay, I was hoping two, you give would. Give me two minutes. All too often... We say we don't believe in merit salvation, earning our salvation. Raise your hand if you believe that. You don't merit your salvation. Is that right? Don't you believe that? Oh, I, don't guess, I guess everybody thinks you're going to earn your way to heaven. I raised my hand. You raised your hand? Yeah, well, good. Thank you. You're a good man. You're supporting me. <laughs> Raise your hand if you believe I don't, I don't earn my salvation. Do you believe that? Raise your hand. Okay. We believe that, and then we live totally different. Hmm. And we preach totally different. Mm -hmm. We treat, we preach, and we try to act like we've got to do it all absolutely perfectly. Get in line. You're not going to do it. None of us have. None of us will. Mm -hmm. Only one did, and he's the one that, Hebrews 12, makes us perfect by his shed blood. Mm -hmm. That's why. This arrangement with God through Jesus Christ and his blood, him serving as our public official, our minister, is a better way. That doesn't mean I don't have to obey God. I didn't say that. That doesn't mean once we're saved, we're always saved. I didn't say that. We are right with God, not because we are perfect. We're right with God, not because of what we've done. We're right with God because of what Jesus done, what Jesus continues to do, who makes it possible for us to be right with God. If Jesus hadn't shed his blood, and if Jesus wasn't making uh, intercession for us with his blood, Hebrews 7, 25, you can be baptized 15 times a day and you're still lost. And yet we go about this idea of, has he been baptized? Has he been baptized? Oh, he gets cancer. Well, let's see if we can get him baptized. Mm -hmm. And baptism is essential. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it isn't. But are we putting as large an exclamation mark behind blood, the blood of Jesus, mm -hmm. which does cleanse, mm -hmm. as we do behind baptism, which tells us when we're cleansed? Mm -hmm. We're perfect because we're 
men made perfect. That's Hebrews 12. We've been made perfect. We didn't make ourselves perfect. We were made perfect by the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. We stay perfect, complete spiritually, by the ever-cleansing nature of Jesus' blood and his sacrifice. And that's why this arrangement is so much better. Mm. There wasn't a Jew one no matter how good he was or she was in Old Testament times that enjoyed that. Not one of them. Mm. Not one of them. But you do and I do. And that's because Jesus is the guarantor mm. of a better arrangement with God via his blood. Hey, don't you think the tension in all of this is, and for for all of us, yes, we, we, we don't want to teeter too close to the line of false teaching. And so maybe that's why, you know, but at the same time, if I'm listening to a podcast like this while I'm listening or while I'm at a conference like this, I'm probably doing okay. But if I go out, you know, in the real world and start living my real life, I've got all these struggles mm -hmm. and sometimes I don't do it right. And guilt settles in and that, you know, sin will do that. Mm -hmm. How, how do, how do I, uh, thread that needle I think just the, right. I think the way to thread that needle is to first of all understand what forgiveness is. Mm -hmm. Which you helped us from chapter and 10. And understand secondly what for, the, when you have it. Mm. When do you have forgiveness? When do you get it? We, mm -hmm. we know that. We emphasize that yeah. baptism. Mm -hmm. But we don't emphasize continuing to have it. Yeah. And we've just done ourselves a very great disservice. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I believe that we have not emphasized this properly or to the extent we should because of what I call reactionary theology. Sure. We are backing away from Calvinism. Mm -hmm. We should combat Calvinism with its once saved, always saved, or preservation of the saints, as they call it. Mm -hmm. But we're backing away from that and we're defending the truth against that to the point that we are unwilling to say once we're saved, hallelujah, we are saved. Yeah. And grasp this idea of we stay clean. Let's pause for a moment with 1 John 1. Okay. Verse 7. If we walk in the light, literally if we keep on walking in the light as he God is in the light, we keep on having fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses, that's a present tense, continually cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us. Uh, I've used this illustration before. I received it from Brother Guy N. Woods years ago. Mm. He talked about that windshield wiper. I bet you've heard it. Yeah. Mm. Here's this windshield wiper going back and forth. And when water falls, rain falls on the windshield, the, the wiper's going back and forth. Here comes a drop. It just wipes it off. It comes a drop. It wipes it off. And it's constantly going. Mm -hmm. He said the windshield wiper is like the blood of Jesus. And those drops of rain are like your sin. When you sin, the blood of Jesus washes it away. Mm -hmm. washes it away, washes it away. So once you sin, immediately, I want you to hear that. Once you sin, immediately you are cleansed. Immediately you are cleansed by the ever-cleansing nature of Jesus' blood if we are people walking in the light. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know years ago I, I would hear people say that's our out you got to do it perfectly if we live perfect lives then yeah, right. that's not walking in the light yeah. we're taking that out of context and making it say something john didn't mean yeah. in the context he talks about three different attitudes about sin i have no sin i'm okay with god I have not sinned. What I'm doing is okay with God. Or if we confess our sins, I sinned and I want to talk to God about it. And I do. Now watch 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse. There's that same word. Mm -hmm. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that word cleanse doesn't translate a present tense verb. It translates an aorist, past tense verb. And here's the point of the two put together. As long as I maintain the right attitude about sin to the point when I sin and I know it, I talk to God about it, I confess it to God, it bothers me because I hurt Him. Mm. And I say, forgive me, Father. He says, forgive you. You were forgiven the moment you did it. The blood of Jesus got you clean. Mm. The blood of Jesus keeps me clean. Brethren, that concept, if you get it inside you, will revolutionize your Christianity. Yeah. 
Christianity is not something you endure anymore. It's something you truly enjoy. Mm. And it will not only revolutionize your Christianity, see what it does to your worship. Mm. And all of that's possible because Jesus makes it certain. I can know that. We could say today, you can go to the bank with that. Yeah. I can know that I know that I know that that is true because of Jesus and his post after post resurrection ministry mm -hmm. and the ever cleansing nature of his blood. Mm. He's the guarantor of an arrangement with God that is so much better. Walk away with your Buddhism. I don't want it. <laughs> Walk away with you as a Muslim. Why would you want Islam? Mm -hmm. Walk away with Confucianism. Mm -hmm. Walk away with Catholicism. Walk away with Judaism. None of it holds a candle to what Jesus Christ and him crucified offers us if we are Christians. He's the guarantor of something far, far better than any religion man has ever known, including the religion he devised for Old Testament Israel. Jesus makes things better. That's our time for this episode of Today with Jesus. I want to thank you for listening or watching or attending this session of the Connect Conference. You can find more at thelightnetwork.tv slash TWJ. Let's go live today and every day with Jesus in our heart and our ways. Amen.